this season, as I was praying and praying for our community, is each place I go or each place I speak, um, like whenever I'm speaking at Brad TV, it's usually a message for the nation of Korea. It's not about Brad TV's ministry or any of the Israel-specific ministries, but it's usually a message I feel that God gives to the nation. And then when I go to an individual community on a time, I usually pray and ask God, what do you have for this community? And so as I was praying for hours um, this season, I really felt like God asked me this question, like, who is the king of glory? And I know how simple, like, the simple answer is what? Who's the king of glory? Thank you. Not a trick question this time, I know. <laughs> it's not a trick question. So we, we know the simple answer is, is, is Jesus, but I don't want us to stay in the simple. I want us to, like, understand, like, what are we really declaring? You know, like, to, like there was something in, that, in the song today, in the worship today, as we were like, you're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. And we're like, yes, worthy of it all. But God wants us to not just stay with the word worthy, but worthy of what? Worthy because why? Worthy how? Worthy from you and your heart? What has he done that has made him worthy of you to say all the glory belongs to him? All the worship belongs to him. Now, we know that in our hearts, we still worship other things. We know that we fail. We know that we still have weaknesses. We know all of these things. But there was something of the truth our spirit was recognizing. And we can stay on the surface level of that truth and just resonate with that truth. And you know what? Maybe that's where you are, and that's okay. But for those of you who are ready to go deeper, why is he worthy? How is he worthy? What has made him worthy? What is the glory in your life that you say belongs to him? What, is the thing, what are the things in your lives in which you want to give him literally the honor, the beauty, the reflection of who he is that you want to pour back and say, it all belongs to him and not in that false, humble way. You know, it's very easy. Oh, glory be to God. Yeah, all glory be to him. It's why, I mean, he made me this good. Like, you know, and you're like, we don't want that false humility. We want to know really, like, if you're like, someone says like, well, why glory be to him? And you're like, well, because he's worthy. Well, why is he worthy? Because all the glory belongs to him. You don't want these circular, circular arguments. You need to be able to articulate. That's called testimony. You need to be able to say why. At least one thing immediately should be on your mouth, immediately on your head. And if every week you think of one new thing, and then you say that, you like, this week, you know, why is he worthy? He's worthy because he comforted me when I was depressed. There was a time. Oh, he's worthy because he healed me physically. He's worthy because I didn't have an answer on something with my parents. And even after more than 10 years, yet then the answer came and it was so much greater than I could ever have imagined. And now every day I'm nothing but thankful for how he provided. These are all very true things. And if every week you just add one more thing, you will be a person that is so filled with testimony that at any given moment, whoever God brings into your life, you'll be able to share with them how he's worthy, why you're worshiping him, why you're set apart, why do you spend this time? Why do you give your resources and your gifts to his name, to his kingdom, and to his community? None of this is in my notes. <laughs> it's just what God is doing. It's what God is speaking. And rightly so. The fall feasts, we, we celebrated all the spring festivals together. We had a lovely Passover, feast of first fruits, unleavened bread. We, we remember all that Jesus did. But this is the end times. We're truly living in the end times. It's having some discussions with some people recently, just 
asked earlier today. And it's like, what do you think about Israel? What do you think is going to happen? And the only thing I can say is, I don't know what page of Revelation we're at. Because literally, it depends. If we're very close to the end, it's going to get really, really bad. And if it's not quite the end, then this is just a prelude of what's going to happen. So we, we, we don't know. So we're constantly watching, we're constantly listening, we're constantly paying attention. And that's very much what this season of the Feast of Trumpets is all about. So October 2nd was the Feast of Trumpets. This Friday, October 11th, so it's sundown to sundown, so it begins Wednesday night and it finished on Thursday. The Day of Atonement begins Friday night and it finishes on Saturday. And then the Feast of Tabernacles begins on October 16th and finishes on the 23rd. So next Sunday, we'll talk about the Day of Atonement, and then after that, we'll discuss the Feast of Tabernacles, so I don't have to give you all the ins and outs about those holidays today. But during the Feast of Trumpets, there's many different things and aspects about this holiday, that this is a feast of idioms. I love idioms. Do you guys like idioms? You know, you don't like idioms? Ugh. You know, when I was teaching English, you know, we always had the fun joys of teaching idioms, you know, watch out, and you take off your watch and throw it out, you know. But Jesus, God, Israel, they called this holiday the hidden holiday, the secret holiday. And the reason why is it said it came like a thief in the night. That they said about this particular holiday, no man knows the day nor the hour that the feast will begin. What does this sound like to you? Who else said this? That's right. These are all the same descriptions that Jesus talked about his coming again. All of it. Even the idea of two witnesses. Did you know for this feast to begin, it took two witnesses that they would have to go out and make sure that it was a new moon. But remember, the moon cycle is not exact. It's not exactly 28 days. Sometimes it's 29 days. Sometimes there's clouds and you can't see and you have to guess. But if the two witnesses do not agree, then the feast day doesn't begin. But the people don't know because it might be today. It might be tomorrow. It might be the day after that. And so the, 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 the priest would have to climb to the pinnacle of the temple. Now, how high is the pinnacle of the temple? The pinnacle of the temple would be something like, I don't know, more than two times the size of this whole building. And so he would climb up to the top, and he would have to wait. And then the two, the two witnesses would come back in to the Sanhedrin, to the high priest, and they would either say, we agree that now begins the feast. And if they agreed, they would go out and they would signal the priest who's in the place of the blowing. And they would blow the shofar with the sound of the trumpet. The day begins. And they would blow the silver trumpets, the ones that we read about in this year when, when they were building the tabernacle and God began to say, you're going to worship me with silver trumpets and you're going to worship me with the ram's horns, the shofar. In our Bibles, it usually just says trumpet. And you would blow this trumpet and they would blow the trumpet and the next village would blow the trumpet, and the next village would blow the trumpet, and the next village would blow the trumpet, and they would say that the Jews in Greece would know that the festival had begun in Jerusalem in 45 minutes. All from the blowing of shofar. Can you imagine going down into Africa, going into Asia, going up all the way through the north, 
all the way to, you know, beyond Lebanon and Syria and Turkey, and then from Turkey and Italy and Greece and like the whole world where the Jews were, it, all of a sudden the, the people are hearing the blowing of the shofar. And it's saying it's time to wake up. It's time to pay attention. We had the summer. We were working. We're working hard. It's harvest time. Maybe there's a lot of warfare because this is the time in which the world and the kings like to make war. And maybe we're just exhausted because it was hot. So hot. Every week it was hot. And it's like, oh, I just want to sit outside and do nothing right now. I just want to look at the sky and feel the wind and say, thank God I'm not sweating. I don't want to worry about what else is going to come or what else is going to happen. But the truth is, this is the busy time. This is the time that our spirit must be awake. It's the time that we must be prepared. It's a season for repentance. Because the high priest on the Day of Atonement would walk in and represent the whole nation for the sins committed in ignorance. Can you imagine that, that the things that the people don't know, like how much sin is in your life that you know? Come on, think about it. Think about your sin, the one you regretted this week, and the other one, and then that other one, and you know all of that sin. But what about the sin you're committing you have no idea? None. No clue that you're violating God's ways in some way. That's the day. Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the priest would go. And so all of Israel is getting ready. This is why John the Baptist was out preaching and preparing. The whole nation would go through the baptism to prepare so the high priest could represent them. Because ultimately, it's going to be a great day of judgment. So if you knew that the day of judgment was going to be in five days, think about it. If you knew concretely that the judgment of the end of the world was going to be in five days, how would you behave differently today? What would you do? And that's what this blowing of the shofar is to awaken in us every year. Every year, it's don't hold on to it. Don't hold on to your sin. Don't hold on to your anger. Don't hold on to your bitterness. Don't hold on to your unforgiveness. Don't hold on to your offenses. Don't hold on to, to whatever it is. Humble yourself. Lose your face. Repent to others. Repent to God. Forgive people who haven't repented to you. It's time to be free and to be set free completely. So this is the season of remembrance and tradition. What are we remembering? Jesus is coming again. That the suffering servant paid the price for all. He humbly died on the cross and rose from the dead. And the disciples like, is now the time of your kingdom? Or now you're going to defeat Rome and exalt Israel? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the day nor the hour. And everybody still wants to know the day and the hour. There are people who try to become excellent at revelation and create charts and diagrams and seminars and spend their whole lives studying to know exactly the end. But it's simple. Jesus said, you won't know the day or the hour. So get to it. The harvest is ready. Get to it. Go, therefore, to all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do all that I've taught you to do, and the world will know you by your love for one another. What are we remembering? We're remembering all of these things. 
because it's also the season of the king. It's the season of the appearance of the Messiah. This is when we count the years of the kings. This is the holiday in which ancient Israel, everybody became a year older on the Feast of Trumpets. Everything revolved around so much around this holiday. The spiritual new year, the first of the months, happens in the spring. But the civil one begins now. Now, one of the things that Israel remembers, or by their tradition, I just say tradition. The Bible doesn't say this. It's only tradition. Do you hear tradition? Not authoritative, but kind of interesting, but not authoritative. It's only a tradition. All right? Edon police, are you ready? This is only a tradition. <laughs> no, thus saith the Lord. But they believe that this is the time in which God made the earth and mankind. This is the time... So therefore, this is also going to be the time of the restoration of the fallen earth that was created by Adam and Eve. It's leading us to God's kingdom. It's leading us to the fullness, the kingdom on heaven that is to be here on earth, the fullness of the Messiah where everybody knows the Lord while we no longer have to say know the Lord for everybody will know him. This is the time that we're looking forward to. And we want the king of not just Israel, but of the whole earth to come again. We have a king. He is alive. He is coming to establish his kingdom. There's going to be a real king of a real kingdom. This is why fairy tales have so much power in the minds and the hearts of the world. Because there is a longing that God has put in there for us to know that we are the beloved, we are the bride, and we're waiting for the prince of princes, the king of kings, the lord of lords, to come and redeem and to establish. So we have all of that in our minds, yes? Now, the time of Babylon changed Israel a lot. Many things shifted at that time. Culture shifted. It became much more complex. This is the time in which Jewish education was really established. It was the first time that the synagogue was established. The whole structure of how we run church, do you know, started in Babylon, not in Israel. It all started in Babylon. Because why? Because the people needed a way to stay together. The temple had been destroyed. They were kicked out of their land. They're now foreigners. But we need to stay together. So we created community houses. It's called Beit Knesset. That's synagogue. Beit Knesset. The house of the gathering or the community house. And in God's faithfulness, he brought Israel out of captivity, brought them back to the land. And in the days of Nehemiah and Ezra, they began to rebuild the temple and the walls of Jerusalem. And in doing so, they once again were able to pull out the Torah, the very thing we've been studying all year round. And how did Israel respond? Thursday morning, just a couple days ago, Thursday morning was the day that Nehemiah chapter 8 took place. Now, I don't know about you, but I like to remember, and like if I know a day that something actually happened, it helps it make it more real for me, right? Because I'm thinking about the weather, it's, it's all of a sudden the summer has gone. It's not as hot. It's lovely most of the time in Israel. In Jerusalem, it's still warm in the day, but it gets very cool in the evenings. So this is the time. It says that all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. 
And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the Torah before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. That would have been Thursday, the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the Torah. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for this purpose. And beside him stood Matiyah, Shema, Aniyah, Yurah, Hilkiah, Maseyah, on his right hand, and Pediyah, Mishael, Malchiah, Chashum, Chashbadrana, Zechariah, Meshulam, on his left hand. Isn't that great, those names? Now, if you really want to have fun, Use one of the strong concordance, and you can get the app, and you can touch every name, and then you can see the definition of every name. And if you realize when he's saying this, he's creating a bigger picture, all about the faithfulness of God, who is God, and what God. So all of these people whose names end with Yah is declaring something about God. So they're not just difficult names, but they're declaring God who is faithful, God who provides, God who reveals, God who speaks, all of these kinds of things. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered... I don't think that's how they answered. All the people answered? Amen. 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 Lifting up their hands. And then they bowed their heads and they worshiped the Lord. Now that Lord is the proper name of God, yud Hey vav Hey, sometimes known as Jehovah or Yahweh. The Lord with their faces to the ground. And I like this. And Yeshua, it's one of the first times we really see the name Yeshua. It starts to become a more popular name from this place and from this time. So Yeshua was not just reserved, or Jesus, it was not just reserved for him. It was a name that was popular, that was constantly declaring the truth. And Bani, Sherebiah, Yamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiyah, Maaseyah, Kelita, Azariah, Yozabad, Hanan, Pelayah, and the Levites helped the people to understand the Torah while the people remained in their places. Now, those of you who watched the last season of The Chosen, this is exactly what happened when Jesus was preaching his message to the 5,000, and the disciples went out, and they relayed the message so that the, you know, because his voice only went so far. In one place in Israel, where the first feeding of the 5,000 took place, Everybody could hear because it was a natural amphitheater. But the second place, it was just like this. And if you know where they are in, in Israel, this is probably down closer to the Pool of Siloam, down in that area where Hezekiah built. It's in the very low part. And so where all the people are, it, the, it doesn't, it's very, very, it's not very open. So you need people to begin to relay the voice 
and they read from the book of the Torah of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites taught the people and said to the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the Torah. And he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to the Lord. And do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Thursday, a couple days ago, was the first time, like can you imagine as this is being proclaimed, we still say the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of, hey brother, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And this was proclaimed prophetically and out loud at this time, at this season. So all of these pictures are supposed to come together. The blowing of the shofar, the king who is coming, the awakening of what is about to happen, and the Torah made alive. It's not a thing to be crying over. We're not supposed to be weeping. You know why they were weeping? Because the word of the Lord, they were realizing, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. But they didn't even realize how close they were to the coming of Messiah who would pay the price that the Holy Spirit could begin to write the Torah upon our hearts. It's an amazing time. And then, I mean, it's one of my favorite verses, verse 10. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet wine. Hallelujah. And he said, send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. Are you guys ready? Did you come ready? Did you bring the fat? I mean, I brought the fat. I always bring the fat. (laughs) Amen, Brian. The fat belongs to the Lord, everybody. Some of us belong to the Lord more than others. So before I continue in discussing the season of the king, It's time for us to eat the fat and to have some joy. This is another form of communion. So I brought, because it's our tradition, to eat like apples and honey. And so I brought apple fritters for us. This is an American thing, but as Jews, we love this kind of thing. So uh, if you absolutely hate a donut, because I know some people absolutely hate donuts, there is Korean-style apple pie you know, the cookie apple pie. So there is the Korean-style apple pie. And you brought ginger? Oh, okay. There's very little fat in those, though. (laughs) They are good. So I want to invite you guys to come up. No, no, I'm going to stand up here. Come up, come up, come up. Here, put it on top of this one, and then when that's empty, we'll just move it. Come. There's napkins. Grab something. There's water in the back. We can get more cups if we run out. I want you all to have a little sugar rush as we get to the end. For those of you who are at home, for those of you who are at home, um, Go into your cupboard and get us something sweet and delicious right now. Oh, see, look at that. We got more. And we have more. And we have more. Can, I think they need it. And it will stay here and we'll be here after the service and you can come back and have more and the kids will run down. The kids have apple pie upstairs, but, you know, got to have some advantages of being in the main service. You can wait until that one's empty.
Look at that. Ooh, ooh. Oh, thank you. Are you waiting? Yeah. Don't worry. This is only half of it. We have a whole nother box full. <laughs> yeah. Now, personally, the apple fritter is my favorite donut. The woman, when I ordered them all at the donut shop this morning, she's like, all for you? <laughs> I said, no. Huh? Yeah, she did. <laughs> there's, there's no tape. You can just pull it off. So just move that box and put yeah. Is there coffee? <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. Anybody need more? Did you guys get everything back there? You're all good? It's okay. You have to have a little, just break one in half and take a bite. Come on. You can hand me that microphone if you would like. Oh, <laughs> he just took, oh, look at him. He's like a he's like a squirrel preparing for winter. Now he's gonna sit on it and it's all gonna become crumbs. Uh-huh. Feel free if you're thirsty, there's water right there. There's more cups. If there's no cups here, someone can run upstairs and get a sleeve of cups. Um, but there's enough water. Please. Feel free, okay? Amen? Is this nice? Actually, one time I was caught, I was going to a conference in Pohang, and that year Pohang got a snowstorm, and uh, we got stuck at the bus terminal, and no taxis were moving, and nobody from the conference could come and get us, and we were stuck for several hours, and the only thing in the, term, in the whole terminal that was open was a Dunkin' Donuts. And so we ended up doing communion with Dunkin' Donuts and just started worshiping God right there in the Pohang bus terminal. And then as soon as we were finished with communion and singing, all of a sudden one taxi came and he said, do you guys need to go someplace? And he was like, how did you get in? And he goes, nobody stopped me. And so, nobody, and so he was able to drive us out to the conference. It was really an amazing thing. So in, in, this, in this kind of thing, the Lord wants you to associate, right? The, the word of God is like honey. It's like honey. You know, we're supposed to be in love with the word of God. We're supposed to be in love with his Torah. We're supposed to be in love with his principles. That it's not supposed to be a burden and it's not supposed to be a fearful thing. It's not supposed to be a sad thing, though it cuts our heart. It's one of these strange things because it shows a mirror of where we're not, yet at the same time it reflects the glory of God who calls us and declares who we are. It's a tree of life for everybody who will, grow, who will hold on to it. It's a, it's a path of peace for everybody who will hold on to it. And in some of these feast days, the Lord's like, you need to eat. You need to celebrate. You need to rejoice. God loves our days of celebration. Amen? You know, what's one of the greatest, like, it's not a church holiday, and it's not a biblical holiday, it's not a Korean holiday, but it's a really important day for Crossway. It's October 30th, because that's when Hannah and my birthdays are. <laughs> Can you imagine? Our, you know, so, so for our, our guests, uh, Hannah is in charge of the children's ministry, and she's our chondosa, and her husband is 
you know, Ian, the Bumoksa, and he plays the, you know, worship and, and does these things. And so, so Hannah and I, we actually share the exact same birthday. And the Lord loves to celebrate. And last year, we had an amazing surprise celebration. And then it was great. And Caution made a cake. And some of you made a cake. And we enjoyed it. And, and the Lord loves to celebrate with us. We just had an amazing day at Chusok, and we went down to the, the river, and as we were at the river, we got to enjoy and taco in a bag and kites and, and, uh, and uh, yutari, yut, yunari, huh? Yunori, yunodi, you know, yunori, really big ones, and it was really, it was so much fun. It was so great. The kids were the superstars. They won it for our team. I think our team won every time. Sorry, others. As the Bible says to the Jew first, that's just, that's, it's just what it says. It was an amazing time. But this is the season of the Lord. This is one of his times. This is when he wants to celebrate and he wants to be remembered. He wants to be recognized. That he's the king of kings. And we have to make sure in our hearts, are we recognizing him as the king of kings again? So the 24th Psalm, it says this, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. What does that mean? The world and those who dwell therein. Who does this world belong to? The Lord. Who do the people of this world belong to? The Lord. That's why we call the enemy a thief and a liar. No part of this world belongs to Allah. No part of this world belongs to Buddha. No part of this world belongs to all the Hindu gods. No part of this world belongs to communism and, the, and man's ideal and atheism. No part of this world belongs to the Pope. The world belongs to the Lord. The whole world belongs to the Lord. For he has founded it upon the seas and he established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Are you ready? If God, right now today, was at Mount Zion, would you go? Would you ascend that mountain? Would you pay all the money you could would you go up to that mountain? Would you go up to that place? Who shall stand in the holy place? Do you feel worthy to stand in the holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, Who has a clean hands and a pure heart? Who's the one who had the cleanest of hands and the purest of hearts? Not a trick question. Thank you. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. He was able to ascend the mountain of the Lord. He was assembled to go up. And then what did he say? He's like, I declare you now clean. I declare he even had to give Peter a vision while he was hungry and fasting on a rooftop to stop calling Gentiles unclean. For if the Lord has made them clean, they are clean. It had nothing to do with food. It had to do with you. 
Just as God made Israel clean, Jesus made Israel clean, he made the Gentiles clean, that all who believe in him will be saved. That he's the one who took your sin and washed you. Though your sin was like scarlet, he has made you whiter than snow. Amen? He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Yeshua. We will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God, Yeshua. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Did you seek him? Did you find him? We've had many times people who come here who are not yet believers and they're, and they're not even sure how much do I want to seek him or not seek him. People sometimes are afraid to seek him. Sometimes people are afraid to find him. But you never have to be afraid to find him. He prepares the table in the midst of his enemies that we would no longer be enemies, but we would be family. Once we eat from the table of God, he has given us his hospitality. He must protect us. He must watch over us. He must save us. We're no longer enemies. We're family. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. <coughs> the Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. So, who is the King of glory? Not a trick question. All together now, who's the king of glory? (sighs) Call upon his name. Why is he the king of glory? Because of what he did at Passover. He came and he was humble. And though he was given the name above every other name, and though he could command every angel of heaven, and though whatever he spoke would have to come to pass, (coughs) he spoke, Father, forgive them. (coughs) For they know not what they do. And he saw from the beginning of time and all the sin of his time. And he saw all who would come after. And he said, you're worthy. You're worthy. Israel was looking for the warrior king. Israel was looking for the conquering Messiah. And they got it wrong. They didn't want humility. They wanted charisma and popularity and strength and might and right. But he came humble. He didn't just come for the righteous. But he came for the lost the sick, the needy, the sinner, the really, 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 really bad sinner. And yet, we still want that king who's going to come 
and, and destroy our enemies. We still want the king who's going to come on the horse with the sword and the fire and finally prove, hey, all of us are right who are following his name and all of us who, who've been made fun of and persecuted over time. He was, he's, we're right. But who's the king of glory? He's the humble king. The king of humility, the king of love, the king of peace, the king of joy, the king of patience, the king of long-suffering, the king of kindness, the king of hope. Above all, the king of love. For no greater love is this than he who laid down his life for who? His friends. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son. For who? For everybody. So if Jesus laid down his life for his friends, and Jesus came for everybody, what does that mean? That means everybody in Hanamdong, in Itiwan, they're the friends of God. They just might not know it. Everybody in Pyongyang is the friends of God. They just don't know it. Everybody in Gaza is the friends of God. They just don't know it. Everybody in Jerusalem are the friends of God. They just don't know it. Let's not fall into the sin that Israel did in the day of Jesus as he came as the humble servant. Let's still seek the humble servant. Let's still seek that king who his glory is that he laid down his life for his friends. But because he had no sin, death could not hold him, the grave could not hold him, and he rose from the dead gloriously. <coughs> Amen? So how will you respond to this season? Don't cry. <laughs> How will you rejoice? How will you repent? Remember, repentance is not confession. It's the actions you take to go back in the direction of God. This is a feast right now. This is a feast. We'll talk about the next one next Sunday, but... This is the time for the sweet and the fat, for the goodness of God. How will you position your heart to receive the King of glory? That's the question you have to answer in this season. Ready? So in this specific season, let's respond to our God with joy. Amen? To the King of glory. The same days of Elijah again. Sing it together. These are the days of Elijah declaring the word of These are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. These are the days of great trial, a famine and darkness and soul. Till we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare the way.
no God like Jehovah. There's 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 no God like Jehovah. you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. In the name of the King of glory, be blessed. Amen. Have an amazing week, everybody. Continue to be a blessing as you are a blessing. Thank you.